three. So we're talking about this immunity and we're talking about the special dispensation and everything else. And, and this allowed you then, Manu, to, to go up to the EPM. So that's, uh, I, I guess that's, what is it? Uh, uh, something Publico de Medellin? Publico de Medellin, so a public yeah. service provider. Yeah. So these guys do the water. Uh, what else do they do? Uh, a waste collection, I assume. Electricity. Electricity. Uh, in fact, Affinia is EPM, the one that now provide electricity to the coast, to the Caribbean region, and they're dreadful. So I can only think what they're like in Medellin. I don't know. <laughs> My power outages they're huge, are frequent. They're a huge conglomerate. Yeah. <laughs> they are. They're a huge conglomerate with a lot of um, a lot of power and influence and yes. and money. And they have, you know, there is a history, and this is the effectively the history of formalization of these barriers is that very creative, innovative arrivals, pirate electricity and water, and EPM kind of think, well, we, we can't control this, so we'll formalize it. And then they come in and say, okay, you can have the electricity, but pay us X amount per month. And then bit by bit, public services are gained. Um, and in the vereda that we're talking about, the, the Ghani Sal vereda, uh, water has been, has been pirated, a bunch of pipes do bring water in, but it's it's so dirty that it makes children sick and it brings people's skin out in boils, even after being boiled. Mm. Um, so these these processes that have been going on for 50 years in Medellin of, you know, creative, shall we say, access to services leading to formalization have not been possible in, in these veredas. And um, and I I'm just such a fan of the, the ballsy approach of Comptramidadas in bringing this issue to the EPM library. I just think it's amazing. I, I, well, I, I love this, uh, and, and I love that you've, you've done this. And, of course, I, I hope that you've got an epidemiologist amongst you to do some of the, you know, take through these things that are about to, uh, boiling the water still. You, 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 the people are still getting sick. I mean, that's serious stuff. Uh, it's a serious episode. But I want to talk, uh, because we could go on with a lot of the issues and stuff, but I want to talk about your initial reception in these barrios, Manu. I mean, let's. Uh, you know, I'm, a, I'm a tall white foreigner. You're a, another white foreigner. I can only see you from the waist up. Uh, so therefore, and em <laughs> Emily's a white foreigner. Um, Not a tall one. <laughs> you, know, uh, we, you know, we definitely stand out. Uh, so when you first got out there without any contacts or without communication, you know, in a barrio that, let's say a barrio, if we talk to someone, uh, let's say someone who lives in El Poblado or someone who lives in Yeras or someone who lives up on the mountain there uh, uh, near to the clinic, I want to say El Rosario, somewhere like that, because that's where I was hospitalized for, that's another story. Um, but uh, I want to say people that live in these nice big complexes probably don't leave them too much. You know, they've got a swimming pool and a gym and everything else. You said to them, no, I'm going up blind into La Cruz what would they say to you? <laughs> well, in the beginning, it's always kind of an adventure to a certain kind of extent, of course. Uh, I've been doing that once in Guatemala with a student group, and our professor back then said to, uh, said to us, you now go to these little villages, and in the evening, I want you to be back here with 10 interviews each. And we were panicking. How do we get 10 interviews? How do we approach? people in ordinary people in their houses do i ring the doorbell how am i gonna do this whole thing well what is really interesting about the barrio is completely it's completely contrary to what one would think we always have this uh this perception that the barrio is dangerous and the people should uh, are, are a certain kind of way etc but when you go there what you encounter is actually the most lovely and wonderful people you could possibly imagine and what you also encounter, Richard, is that people want to tell their stories and they want to be heard. So, of course, you have to make an effort first. You have to make the, make the first step. You have to approach them. You have to tell them what you're doing. In Guatemala back then, the problem was that they didn't trust us. They thought we were from the International 
uh, organization for migration and that we wanted to control migratory paths and so on and so forth. We wanted to investigate them and so on and so forth. This is a problematic uh, position you're in. If you're a social researcher, if you want to do empirical research in, in, in a barrio in Colombia, uh, you, you, you have to reflect on your role as well. I mean, how do people perceive you? But in general, you can simply approach them, start talking to them, tell them, be honest about what you're doing, tell them what you're doing, where you go, how the, the whole thing is set up. And obviously in the beginning, uh, uh, many people are suspicious as well and so on uh, and so forth. But in general, the people are incredibly happy to talk to you, to be, to, to be, to be heard. It's a very important aspect. Most of the people told us that they feel completely left, uh, left alone, that no, but nobody's interested in their stories and that nobody ever shows up. There is no police there, there is no municipality there, there's no one who is interested in their life, except, except when, when it's elections. <laughs> elections is, then all of a sudden a few politicians would show up and so on and would tell them that uh, big improvements are going to happen and so on. But no one is, in, in, in general, uh, much interested in the life of the barrio. And my idea and our idea was to to tell their story. So, so, so uh, and another us. thing I loved about this project, just as a as a journalist, and I know, and I know, a lot of us feel this way, is that there's there's a lot of very justified concern about feeling extractive, about going into a place, taking a bunch of quotes, and running. Um, and you know, getting your byline, etc. And what I loved about this project is that we we weren't just doing interviews. We also set up day long workshops in which groups of people were taught how to use a professional camera or made a documentary um, with our head of um, photography and video, Pipe, who's brilliant, who went in and taught big groups and brought resources. And you know, we made an enormous sancocho up in one of the um, one of the barrios for a lunch. There was there was something much more interactive and less extractive about this process. And also of, of creating a comfortable environment in which to talk to people where you are genuinely sharing and communicating. Sure. Because you, you, you have a certain type of interaction as a journalist if you show up and you're like, hey, tell me a story. Whereas if you show up with a group and you bring things and you interact and you communicate, you get very different stories out of people. Um, and these workshops were a real lesson in that, I think. I would say bringing a sancocho is the way to break down any barrier, <laughs> especially because food is just it's pivotal, though. And then you're all around it and you're all sharing. So, you know, I think uh, there's that famous book written. I can't remember his name, but the poverty safari. You're not doing that. Uh, and uh, that's important. So you are doing these workshops and you're sort of, I guess, listening, I think is the biggest thing, isn't it? Listening right. and observing. But uh, now you've got this exhibition and you've trained up uh, let's, local kids and adolescents, I imagine, in, in how to use cameras and how to record and, and take photographs. Is this, uh, is this then something that's going to be long term? I mean, is this going to continue this, uh, this, the projects that you have in, in these barrios? Because that, that's part of the thing is when you say, and I'm not. I'm just playing a slight devil's advocate here because you say you no, know, it's not extractive. But people feel abandoned, you know. And so we come with the best intentions, but people do feel abandoned. Is it true? Well, well, Richard, uh, another difficult question, uh, uh, very hard for me, me to answer. What we try to do to a certain kind of extent is, is um, I think. We were also thinking about uh, uh, the role of academia, the role of research in, in such an area. And the idea was also, okay, these people, most of those people don't have, have access to the public discourse, to the world of arts and academia. And uh, the idea was, okay, we need to reach out. We need to think about what is our role? What can we do? How can we include the, uh, the communities? I give you one example. Uh, Gorgori is a very young, um, his name is called, Go uh, they call him Gorgori, his name is called uh, Juan Felipe. And uh, he's a young 18 year old uh, social leader. And uh, we try to include him. We try to tell him, okay, look, uh, Gorgori, we want to set up this thing here. Can you help us? 
can you ask Donia Anna to, to cook us the Sancocho while we're having the, the workshop? We want to bring you something, uh, uh, do the, the, the photography and film workshops with you together. And so there is a certain kind of knowledge engagement that we bring. Uh, we try to engage a little bit long term, etc. But of course, as you say, um, uh, how long does the project last and what is the long term uh, impacts? Well, <laughs> This is a difficult question. We are on it, let's say. We've uh, also written a, a scientific report. So we, uh, we try to give uh, the, the academic uh, community a, a bit something back, let's say. Um, we try to publicize it as much as we can. And we try to also uh, uh, reach out to, to our home countries, let's say. So we mm -hmm. set up a, a collaboration with a Dutch um, a museum, uh, which will feature us and, and in, in, in different sorts of ways and also with, uh, with Austrian institutions. Uh, and Austri also Austrian uh, newspapers probably uh, now we're here in Colombia calling. So this is what we're trying <laughs> to, to do. Um, mm. Yeah, Emily, uh, would you like to add something to it? Yeah, I think there's there's an inevitability to try not try to minimize the number of syllables. Uh, <laughs> it's, ephem it's ephemeral, sorry, <laughs> bad, bad non-journalistic habits. It's Working with storytelling is always ephemeral. Um, people hear a story, they go to an exhibition, and then they go home and their lives go on. And, and you do, you accept that as part of the work that you do, even as an activist. Um, but it is still totally key, though it, it can only be limited as a piece of storytelling. It's still incredibly important and to shift someone's perspective even a little bit or make EPM feel even a little bit uncomfortable, <laughs> or you know these these small changes, these small changes that you can make with storytelling, and I think that that's why all of us do what we do. Mm. Um, it's just those like those little tiny shifts that that hopefully accumulate, um, and I think you know giving giving a sense of visibility to people who feel abandoned is one thing, um, but we have also you know effectively left reasonably large amounts of money in all of the barrios that we've been to because everything was done by and with ONGs, ONGs, ONG, NGOs, as they're known in English, um, <laughs> from those barrios and even the, the shelves that we used in the exhibition were built by a carpenter from one of the veredas. It was very much um, community based. Um, so there, there has been, you know, and again, leaving money in a place, ephemeral, it enters the economy, it dissipates much as a story does. Um, but I do think it's important. And we've got such a, a passionate and, and talented team, um, both on the academic side and on the creative side, the designer Archie and the photographer Pipe are just geniuses, both of them Colombian guys. Um, and I think, I think we'd all love to see this exhibition in other spaces or to repeat it in other cities or with other themes um, and keep making those, those small shifts in, in people's consciousness. I have a contact. I'm going to look Ooh. at my contact in Bogota. <laughs> wow. um, yeah. uh, but here's a deal. Here's a deal. I rem recall reading a book by Paul Theroux, Theroux uh, a long time ago, and he recovers, he, he covers a, a journey that he made back as a, as a student, you know, where he wrote about, it. I think it was the Dark Star Safari or the one through Africa. And he, he repeats the problem when he comes back. It's about 40 years later, and it's the same rotation of uh, people waiting for the next NGO. You know, so uh, and I think that is an issue and I'm not. No, no, of course, I'm not doing this. But uh, I think that what you have done is empowered some of the youth and helped them see different possibilities and potential. I think I think that's one of the huge advantages of a position that you have taking something like storytelling and creativity and so i'm going to let you off the hook on that one <laughs> but um i wanted to ask you though if we moved on uh to the exhibition itself because we got to get more people through those doors uh but you had the launch you had the inauguration on the 17th and how how did it how was it received i mean i want to know who turned up what did they say who said that they were never going to talk to you again 
come what, what happened <laughs> did did the people involved in the actual the, the kids the adolescents the communities did they come to the launch as well Yes, Richard. So what we tried to do is actually it was a huge success for us, at least. <laughs> so the, 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 we were about 100 people at the inauguration. We, I think it was even a very special and very important e event for EPM itself, for the foundation of EPM, where we, where we show the exhibition. The director showed up, also a representative uh, from the Austrian embassy showed up, the cultural, uh, cultural uh, representative of the Aust Austrian embassy. And we tried to invite as much uh, community leaders we could and people from the from the Vereda. So now, what is going go going to happen if you invite people from from the barrios? Their first concern and the first problem is that they need the money to come down to the city center. They often don't even have mm -hmm. the, the, the tiniest a bit a uh, bit of, of of money. So we said to them, look, if the money to come down to the, to the inauguration is the problem, please, uh, we're going to give it to you. That is not going to be the issue. And also we had a group of young dancers, Afro-Colombian dancers, who gave us a performance at the inauguration. And this was really wonderful. And it was received very, very positively. Also the local TV station, the te uh, station Telemedellin, showed up and, and uh, we gave them an, an interview and the internal communications department of EPM uh, interviewed us. So it was a huge success for us. And in terms of, of the exhibition itself, I think the whole setup was very, how can I say, participatory, transparent, uh, lo uh, very colorful. We tried to make a very uh, aesthetically appealing uh, exhibition, which uh, ch uh, which has some formal parts or some more some more uh, museum style parts and some more community ba based uh, parts. So we used estantes, uh, shelves, wooden shelves, which have been uh, constructed by a carpenter in the in the Vereda. Uh, we st st sticked uh, uh, pictures on it and and used different objects and elements from the barrios themselves, which they brought to us. Mm -hmm. They brought to us those objects uh, and we, we set it up together with them. They even helped us to create the, the exhibition and we built these little casitas. So these little houses, tiny little houses, which uh, are a symbol for, for the improvised house in the barrio itself. Wooden built houses, which are very improvised and often the people in the, in the barrios don't have doors. They use curtains instead. So one of the residents came to the exhibition space and knit the curtain curtains herself for our uh, casita door. So, and inside these casitas, inside these little little houses, we have the projections. We have the film projections, their own little documentaries, which they created um, uh, about their barrio. Where the one is called uh, "This is my barrio," and the the young people, the teenagers, and the children tell us, okay, what is what what is important for them when 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 they think of their barrio and what what are their necessities what are their dreams and uh yes mm -hmm. and another aspect that i wanted to mention is that these dreams and these wishes this is something which is something really ast astonishing uh one would think uh, if you go <laughs> into these barrios and as a as a last question of the interviews we, we made with the people there was often, what is your dream house in the future? If I gave you uh, um, money uh, as much as you wanted, what kind of house would you like to have or what kind of improvement in the barrio would you like to have? And it was so, so surprising how humble and simple the answers were. Most of the people just said, I would like to have a house with three, with three rooms in it. That's it. And I'm kind of like, but wouldn't you want to have a, a swimming pool or I don't know what, or a, a big mansion or whatever? No, no, just three rooms because we are three people. We need three different rooms. That's it. And this is really surprising. And uh, in general, if you, if you ask people about their dreams, you will see that uh, most of their dreams are just the same as, as yours and, and mine. It's, a, it's, a, it's amazing. I think... I think you know we've got five or six more minutes, and I wanted to to just start, touch on it. And maybe Emily, you, you're in in the position to to talk about it a bit as well. Is that you're doing this contra mirada, taking this counter perspective, is 
to acknowledge Comuna Trece, but also move on because it's got all of the attention and it it is always in the press and Medians always receiving accolades and, you know, justifiably, but it's a big city. <laughs> it's a big city. And the transformation is, the transformation is real. But I think, um, and this is what a lot of Manu's studies have shown is that, you know, the, met the Metro is somewhat fetishized uh, as a, a panacea, as a cure-all uh, to Medellin's development problems. And um, a lot of the interviewees in, in Santo Domingo, where the cable cars arrived, said, house prices rose. I can't afford my home anymore. You know, the, the muchachos, the, the illegal groups are still running security around here. We still don't have proper roads, you know. It is, it is amazing and it is something to be proud of, the Metro, but it, it doesn't fix everything. And the electric staircases in Comuna Trece haven't fixed everything. Neither have the fact that the place is still full of tourists. There are still lots of small businesses in that comuna who are paying vacunas to armed groups to maintain their security. You know, even the most celebrated place with its innovation and its artistic focus. I think we need, we need to be careful of uh, hyper-focusing on a certain story that we like that gives us hope um, at the cost of acknowledging the complications and the holistic nature of the approach that needs to be adopted in order to actually improve people's lives in a sustainable way. Um, and Comuna Terese, you know, it's a ride, great street art, great dancing, escalators outside, woo, but you know, it's not, it's not done. The job isn't the done. The socioeconomic effects uh, don't show, don't show uh, big improvements in terms of education, healthcare, mm. uh, infrastructure provision and so on. Uh, so the problem is really we plea for hol holistic approaches. We need more holistic approaches. If you construct a metro and you don't, a metro cable, which is, which is outside visible, visible infrastructure and all of a sudden, and, and, and you don't ask the people where to put the columns, for instance, and all of a sudden, Doña Marta from, from one of the barrios tells us, well, they just put a column in front of my house, just right in front of my house. I cannot even leave my house properly anymore. I mean, this is unbelievable. Mm. And, uh, and theoretically, the metro says, yes, we have participatory pro uh, processes. And uh, uh, yesterday I had an interview with uh, the Ministry of, of Transport here in in Medellin who said, yeah, well, not everyone's gonna always applaud to the measures we're gonna take in the city. <laughs> yes, but we need much more participati uh, participatory uh, uh, processes because otherwise, uh, if, you, if, you, if you value the lives of the people who live there, you need to take them seriously. You need to ask them, you need to ask them, what are your wishes and necessities? What are your biggest problems? And you need to involve those people. Mm -hmm. Mm. Well, and acknowledge the ugly side, I think, yes. as well. I think the, the, the ongoing presence of, of armed groups and actually, you know, the complexity of that story in, in the places that we're talking about, those groups provided resources to people to build houses for some of the big mafia chiefs funded. And I, I'm not saying they did this out of the goodness of their heart. This is all, this is all part of the business model. But, you know, they, they funded health centres. They have stepped in repeatedly where the government has been absent. Um, and that's a, that's an uncomfortable truth and it's a messy story, but to really address the problems, you need to look at the historical context, how these people have arrived, how these communities have built up. If the state totally abandons a place and someone else steps in, that community is, is going to be skeptical about state intervention subsequently. It's a, I, it's a complex situation. It's a, it's a statistic now, isn't it, of how, how few people actually, uh, you know, believe in the state. I mean, it's it's at, at record lows right now. I think in Colombia, I, um, this this point, and we will have to end on on a couple of points here. This point of the armed groups, uh, I do have to ask. They're not going away. I mean, because this, you know, this is the truth. But you guys didn't have to deal with them in these barrios, did you? You were shielded. We were lucky. Yeah. Since we <laughs> Since we got this access uh, through the, the social leaders, we were lucky enough to not, uh, to not 
be confronted with those armed groups, mm -hmm. the idea was to talk to them as well. Mm -hmm. This is, of course, a very difficult, uh, uh, very difficult uh, thing to do, and this has to be set up properly. Mm -hmm. It is not easy, mm -hmm. and uh, we were lucky enough uh, to 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 be guided. Once you go to one of those barriers with a with a recognized uh, social leader, then you're fine then you're protected, you can go there with the cameras. And this was always an issue. Can we go there? Are we safe? What about women in particular? In particular? Uh, and, and so this, is, this, is, uh, this was always an issue and it will always be an, uh, an issue, these uh, security concerns. And I think we, have to, we had to take them seriously also. And we also went to these barriers with uh, technical equipment. And the question was always, OK, are we safe there? Can we take it there? Can we fly with the drone around? And can we use our cameras there? And so on and so forth. Yes, these things have to be clarified before. Definitely. Definitely. You, uh, Emily, you stayed. Uh noticeably quiet on that one but don't talk <laughs> but anyway um let's um no, I, I have to i felt i did feel safe and we only went during the day but right. you you know the presence is is felt in the interviews people yeah. talk about los muchachos, los muchachos in interviews with you yeah and you and you nod and sort of think good god i know what oh, that means okay. so, mm. so let's wind this down unfortunately we don't have any more time so, guys, who wants to do it? Who wants to do the plug for the uh, exhibition? Who wants to tell you where are the links? How can people go? What are people doing? Go for it. Who's going to do it? Manu? Uh, Emily? <laughs> <laughs> I, the director of the exhibition, Manu, is going to direct you towards both the event itself and the links now. So, please, guys, come and join. We are present on Instagram. Our name is Conta Miraz. There you can find uh, uh, micro stories and and uh, pictures of the events and links to the to the to the media uh, uh, interviews and stuff we did. Uh, this is one option. The other thing is uh, go to the city center of Medellin, Plaza de las Luces. There is a huge building which is Biblioteca EPM. It's a huge concrete building. It is uh, actually a very exciting uh, architectural uh, construction. It's called Biblioteca EPM, Parque de las Luces, Plaza Cisneros, uh, right in front, uh, in, in front of uh, La Alpujarra. So that's where we are. This is where the exhibition is going to be from 17th of, uh, where we started on the 17th till the end of October. Mm -hmm. And we have an outside gallery. Uh, you can already see us on the main square on the Parque de las Luces. Uh, you can see uh, the outside part of the exhibition already with 36 panels, is that correct? Uh, outside, which explains the exhibition and, and um, uh, tells uh, stories uh, on, the on the people of the barrio. And then we have our, our biggest and most important part is the inside uh, exhibition in the Galleria de Arte, in the Arts Gallery. And there you can wander through, uh, through our exhibition. I think it's very, very exciting to see it. You get a lot of uh, uh, dates, uh, statistical data, and, uh, uh, and personal stories. And you have these little casitas and houses where you can sit down and watch some some videos and documentales from the from the people themselves so i think it's a very exciting exhibition i would love to have you all there phenomenal thank you thank you uh manu thank you so much for your time thank you emily it's so great you were working together and, and, and also facilitated us in this this conversation that we've had it sounds like a very exciting exhibition it appeals to me having done studies in in inner cities and in city of bogota uh so i i would go but no I, I i'm not going to go to medellin unfortunately i don't think in these months but i will work as hard as I can to get you to bring it to Bogota. So there you go. I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to yeah. call up my my contact and say, listen, this is what we need. Uh, so we'll see what we can do <laughs> together. And so thank you. Go everyone. Go Fantastic. to Contra Mirada. Go to the Counter Perspective there in the uh, Biblioteca EPM. This is this is amazing. And of course, let me remind you all. Emily Hart is here our famous newscaster, the reporter <laughs> who collates, digests and delivers uh, the news for you every single podcast. And you can sign up for the subscription service on uh, on our Patreon campaign. That's patreon.com forward slash Columbia Calling. And for one dollar, 
one US dollar, which at the moment is great in pesos. It's like 4,000 pesos. But uh, one, <laughs> one US dollar, you can get the news delivered to your WhatsApp account on Mondays. So that's, uh, you know, digested in just under five minutes. It's amazing. And we've had, as of the moment we are recording, 21 new signups. I, I'm just overwhelmed. It's flattering that people want to do this and support us. So it's fantastic. It really Thank is. you to all of you who've signed yeah. up. I'm going to mention you at some point. I'm going to write down all your names and mention you all. And so uh, in a big in a big list. And I'm, I'm just flattered that you want to help this. And so we're going to we're going to end this episode 390. It's been I, I you know what I've really enjoyed this episode. I think having the three of us here is, is, is has been a fun dynamic. And uh, I hope that we can drive just a, a few more people to the exhibition and that it can be something that's, you know, as, as you say, holistic and long lasting. So thank you again for your time on the Columbia calling podcast uh, i've been talking to emmanuel oberlander i want to say oberlander uh, austrian who's a resident in medellin emily hart of course needs no introduction uh to all of you out there check out her website emilyhart.co.uk there's uh, her clippings are on there you can see some very erudite articles on there too and so i'm going to sign off <laughs> thanks richard You're welcome <laughs> got to get the flattery in um, no, I'm loving it, loving it. Keep going. <laughs> uh, but this has been episode 390. Uh, I've been Richard McCall for the Columbia Calling Podcast. And thank you again for listening. Uh, we'll be back next week. Bye-bye.